I popped this out of studio mode and into two camera mode. Let's go early. Why not? So, hey, everyone. I'm here with returning guest Stefan Haney, who um, came with, came, uh, what, it was just before Christmas. We talked about product management. And um, that was very popular. We had a lot of people interested in that. Um, Stefan can introduce himself, but he spent a long time at Amazon where among other things he quarterbacked the detail page which is the main page on amazon where you get to click the buy button so from an amazon viewpoint it's where all the money comes from and they cared a lot about every pixel on it uh, and at the same time thousands of people including me were always petitioning to change it to be our way we needed to have this we needed to have that and so he was Everybody at the nexus of that exciting process i'm sure it was fantastic at all times uh, but today what we want to talk about is um, how amazon structures teams and i think a little bit i want to motivate why why should you care because not all of you are managers and not all of you want to be managers and build teams yourselves so why would you care um basically i think the reason to care and uh, you can jump in is it lets you figure out if the team you're on has a chance of success and how good and what can you do if you need to change that how well organized is your team um, is it set up for success there are things you can bring in even if you're not the manager you can ask the right questions you can propose the right changes and if you're looking for a job or you're in a job and you recognize that your team is hopelessly ill-structured you can pull the ripcord um and and so yeah exactly because there's a lot of a lot of options in life so uh, it wouldn't be fair though i'm going to switch views here real quick and then i'll i'll let stefan finish introducing himself what i want to do real quick is just show his company um uh so he has his own very spiffy website i love it let me i'm doing a bad job managing my windows here there's some good hiking in that picture that we may yeah. have, we may have so overlapped. His his website is uh, vantageleader.com. And what? This is a view of the bridge over um, the Columbia River. Over the Columbia River at the city of Vantage, right? Yes. Yes. Is this taken from the bottom of Frenchman Coulee, roughly? Uh, that would probably be about where we were, yeah. Or the I, winery? Were you at the winery there? I was not at the winery at that one. Um, okay. I've, I've done a fair amount of bicycle uh, touring, uh, and I've, I've ridden my bike. We're from Chicago and Michigan, so we've done I-90 past Vantage many, many times. And, oh, you, um, drive, I, you drive east? Yeah. yeah, my wife loves that view. She, she loves that right there. Well, so for, our, for me, this, uh, this view is right. There is a huge, probably the best rock climbing area in Washington. Washington is not really known for great rock climbing. But yeah. this is the best rock climbing spot in Washington State is right where this picture is taken from. Yes. Um, it's a set of basalt columns, which are really interesting. If you've never climbed basalt, there's these huge, in this case, six to 10 foot um, across hexagonal columns. And you, you can climb sometimes on the face, but often in the cracks between them. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So vantageleader.com and, and cause you know, Ethan, I think we talked about this last time, you know, uh, businesses are systems and systems are made of components. And one of my takeaways from Amazon is, uh, as I talk to clients or talk to company or people, uh, helping them change their mental model, how they're you know, kind of thinking about how their businesses run usually implicitly is one of the biggest levers for change. Um, and so it's, you know, it's more fun to say vantage. Like let's, let's take a look at your vantage point. Uh, or let's take a look at your vantage on this and and see if we can make it explicit. How are you viewing this? Uh, so that's my clients. Um, I really appreciate it. just quick finish the intro. Uh, I think it's a pre-qualification to have kids when you run the detail page. Certainly doesn't hurt. Uh, my wife and I have a pack of them, seven kids, seven to 18. Uh, and that certainly prepared me for all the demands uh, of people who wanted attention uh, to get their priorities on the detail page. It is a privilege to have uh, led a team or a group of teams uh, to run the magic money button of the internet. 
uh, an magic ex- money button of the internet. That is, uh, yeah. See, neither of us works for Amazon now, so we can make comments like that that would make PR <laughs> squirm just very slightly if we were still there. <laughs> oh, super fun. But I think the thing that preps us for, for this a little bit uh, is prior to that, my I had started 2003, right? And we were on, uh, I was in supply chain ops, which is Wilkie's org uh, at the time. Uh, and that was a big growing you know, IPC or kind of the inventory planning of Amazon. That that organization now is hundreds of people. I remember when it was five, right? And it was that's one one manager plus four people. So these seeds grew into organizations, and then uh, the same thing occurred in my time during marketplace. I'm sure you must have seen it Twitch as well. We went from the 75, 80 people to uh, you know hundreds, and how you change your process and when do you decide to split a team? Uh, and how do you decide to make them functional versus solution or two pizza teams? Um, plus the injection of that two pizza team idea occurred in there. So uh, uh, lots of you know, kind of examples for me to think about what, how are you built putting teams in place in your company? Uh, yeah, so... Of course, there's a million ways to design teams. Um, And before the show, we were just talking about the fact that uh, one of my old colleagues, and I'm sure you knew, did you know either Colin or Bill when you were there? I knew Bill because I had worked uh, intersected. He had a brief time when he had physical and digital. Digital, Um, yep. yep. Um, So I got to work around him at that point. So I talked about this in my last show. Uh, My old boss, Bill Carr, and uh, one of his colleagues, Colin Breyer, just put out a book called Working Backwards. And Working Backwards essentially, uh, yeah, there you go. Hold it up again, do it again. (laughs) Keep it on screen a little bit. There you go. So Working Backwards um, is a brand new book released Tuesday, last week, so a week ago, Um, from uh, two Amazonians, now both gone like uh, Stefan and I are. And, Basically, they didn't set out to tell an Amazon history. Instead, they set out to say, look, this is how Amazon works and you can actually replicate it. You can take this like a toolkit and plug it in in other places. We were already planning the show and there is a a huge overlap between what's in the book and what we think is interesting to talk about. Um, Because basically, we've been trained in the same mechanisms they have. And like I said, we're going to talk about how you can structure a team so it has a good chance of success. What kind of people do you need on it? How do you try to put the team together? And you can listen to that. And if you work somewhere and look, if you're a manager and I saw some of our managers check in and chat, you're going to get a ton out of this. Uh, And if you're a founder, I know at least one of the people here is working on founding his own startup. Same thing. But if you're neither of those and you simply work in a team, you can use it as a scorecard of like, hey, is my team set up for success? Like, what are my odds? And so... um, You have all those choices. Uh, so where do you want to tackle this? Do you want to, you you know, you had this idea. Where would you like to start? And then we can just riff on it. Yeah. yeah um, well, let's see. We'll dive in from the side and see if that brings us around to someplace interesting. Sure. Uh, you know, I'm also working on a stealth startup. We're, we're a couple of weeks away from, from probably sharing more broadly. As I was working with one of the founders, we were talking about uh, how I was thinking about the engineering team. And he's... Uh, 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 at a company, it's kind of midsize. Uh, and he was having a hard time. Uh, we realized we're viewing it from different ways. Cause I'm like, look, I expect the engineering team to own the business results. Uh, they're building a system and they need to be able to speak to that system. And in my story, you know, when I was leading the procurement team, inventory purchasing team for Amazon, if a retail category was out of stock, you know, Jeff Wilkie, the supply chain leader would be like, why did the software not work, right? You know, and I was expected to speak in a weekly business review just as much, uh, if maybe more, felt like more, but just as much as a category leader was. Uh, and so that was my point of view is as, you know, an engineering team needs to own the outputs of their system. They need to own the business results of their system. Um, turns out, as I've talked to some other clients, that's not apparently a common thing. <laughs> That, you know, so, you know, do you think there's trade-offs or, you know, how are you finding it, Ethan? Is, am I crazy? Uh, Should I expect a software team to have some amount of business ownership of their results of their system? Uh, 
I think you should expect it, but you will not often find it. Uh, you know, there's so much of a, I was just counseling someone here. I'll ping you about this. Uh, if I say software team and I say IT, are those the same to you or different? Uh, this is another thing I've added the founder. Those to me are different things. IT to me, that's like a backbone back office. That could be servers. That could be the laptops you hand your employees. Uh, could be networking, but that's pretty deep infrastructure versus software to me is a different thing. We're building, you know, so technical solutions to that are going to be operated or solve a problem. Yeah. And so I, where that came up is, is a woman with a really quite stellar education and some good experience was presenting herself as an IT program manager and wondering why she was getting no bites as a TPM from a tech company. And I'm like, you're basically, unfortunately, you're presenting she's, yourself. What's that? She's like self sidelining. She's like yeah. sidelining herself. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully, uh, I'm. I I ask you that leading question because that's what I told her, and I felt a little bad because I think whether it's fair or not, most software and product geeks see IT and they think glorified help desk, or they think, you know, uh, maybe if you're above help desk, if you're you're working on like deploying and connecting the um oh god what i'm having a mind blank what are the systems that track all of your uh like costs and hr hr data the sure sure all your back office systems yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, accounting and there's an and, acronym for it and i'm yeah. it just fell out of my mind but um not falling out of mind yeah, yeah. so uh HRMS is is pure. Uh, ch chat's trying to help me out. Um, it's also when when you track all of your inventory and um, it's like the system you use to keep track of all your parts you've ordered and stuff like that. ERP, thank you. Ken of Rocket yeah. got it. Oh, so go. yeah. So when I think of IT, I think of like the people who set up and run the ERP system, which is a hard job, and I am not diminishing it. But it's very different than software development. So if I get a resume that says IT program manager, I think of the person who deploys ERP, not the person who innovates necessarily new software. So coming from I don't circuit, necessarily think of a builder. I think of an engineer. I may think of, you know, there might be some engineering, but it's a different kind of engineering. Correct. Uh, and well, it's not. it's hard and difficult and valuable, but not the same. And so uh yeah, I'll, I'll I'll send her this clip and be like, see, I just want to say like, I check someone else who and, and your word self sidelining is exactly what I told her. Resume content's also always super popular here. So um, the point is, if you're writing a resume and you have a choice, depending on what you want to do, if you want to be an IT, say IT. But if you don't want to be an IT, as we've just defined it, do not say IT. Find a way to say it's software, if that's what you've done. Right. So. But what I find is um, the reason I ask that question is in many companies, software is lumped with IT. And if the main function of the business is we're a bank or we're Procter & Gamble or we're whoever, they don't see themselves as software companies. And what software they do have is in IT. And they don't encourage those folks to think. They encourage them to take a spec and deliver what's ordered. And so then if you have people coming out of that environment or you go to a company with that environment, they don't have the idea that they own the business results. They have the idea that they take a spec and build what they're asked. So, yeah. And it's just so foreign to me because I'm like, if I have a set of people and we're trying to accomplish a mission, I want to know what the value of that mission is to, uh, what the value of that mission is to the, the, the PL and the, and the bottom or the top line of the business. Uh, and that right. was the interesting founder discussion that was, was pickling on me a little bit um, was, you know, he's like, well, do we need more software engineering? You know, and how would you think about that? I'm like, every software engineer should, you know, I should see that as a contribution to the growth of this company uh, because they're going to build something that is going to have measurable impact uh, on our revenue growth or our EBITDA growth by either doing a function better or by uh, what its outputs are. 
And uh, yeah, we were wrestling through like, why is this clear to me and not clear to him? Like, this is a smart guy. He's done a bunch of stuff. He's pretty accomplished, but he had never looked at software that way. Right. Uh, hey. He had looked at it as like, we have specs, go get it done. Yeah. And, and um, that difference, we talk a lot in this channel, something else you're super familiar with ownership, both from the Amazon ownership principle and from a book you may have seen called extreme ownership. Yeah. Um, you're basically saying you want your software teams to be owners. Yes. You, you want them to own the business, to have a sense that they're responsible for it, uh, to have a sense that they are on the hook for not did I, it's not a defense. See, I ran this team called the Amazon app store. I'm sure you know about it. Oh uh, yeah. And yeah. I had a year where I told one of my colleagues, I'm disappointed with this year. And here's why we wrote a bunch of goals. I'm going to hit all the goals and I'm not going to meaningfully improve the business. And so that's actually a failure. It means I did a shitty job on goals, but it, if it was possible to like hit all the goals, but not really improve the business, something was wrong. And that's a failure, right? That's, that's a failure, um, in so many ways. So, uh, anyway, I'll let you take the ball back. Where do you want to? So answering your question, yes, you should expect them to, but that's a change for a lot of places. Yeah. So, you know, breaking that up, because we can take that two different ways. In the startup part of it, obviously, I have a founder stake and I, I have a voice. And so we're able to, to poke on that. Uh, and I'm able to push and go, look, we're going to move really fast uh, and we're going to grow. Yeah, Lord willing, that's where we're headed. So um, I need to, I want to invest that team in growing the right way. And the best way I know how is by making them owners. All the ideas don't have to come from me. And I'm essentially giving them their railroad track. And we said, hey, this railroad track is how you're going to deliver coal to the business. Uh, feel free to identify all the opportunities and ways that you can deliver more coal, right? More EBITDA, what, more, uh, you know, more management capability, you know, better operations. And I'm going to check in on you. Now I can inspect periodically, uh, but I don't have to direct as much because we're done with that. And I don't have to kind of keep the ideas spinning over here because we're invested. Uh, and so, I, you know, we're able to set that up. On other teams, you know, when you have the IT piece, there's this functional organization. Even early Amazon days, you know, pre, you know, pre fitness functions. It's going way back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I take a breath, you know, fitness functions. <laughs> but, you know, this came out of that book uh, where a video game, uh, engineer and, you know, meets a, a biologist of how do you get big and stay nimble? Uh, you know, but pre two pizza teams at Amazon, it was, you know, I owned the, the procurement team and we cut, we cut purchase orders. And I find that in a number of clients, this is what we do, right? We cut mm -hmm. purchase orders. We calculate, we run the ERP. We, and, and the question is, well, if you want to innovate, are you too insular? Right. Have you just we've got our function. We do our stovepipe really well. Well, this is so now now we're ready for serious philosophy, right? Because we've agreed we want teams that teams and people, not okay. just teams, individuals who feel like they own things and have a big sense of. I am here as a missionary. Um, I'm here to make the business better, to have a result, to drive an end outcome. Um, and I want to I want to do good for the company and the business and the customer. But how do you then put bounds on that? So on the one hand, you don't want too insular. On the other hand, you don't want boil the ocean where people are running around sticking their noses in everyone else's business unnecessarily or too expansively. So uh, the normal problem. Uh, and there's a good comment here in chat about. Think process, not departments. People get stuck on what's their department. And process normally cuts across departments. Ownership often cuts across departments. But do you have a philosophy about or advice or comment or story on where the boundaries of ownership are? Like how, how big should I think? Because if I work at Amazon today, as an example, or pick another company, 
and I'm not the CEO, there are limits to what I should worry about. Sure. Uh, well, I think the, um, you know, there's certainly limits on what I should worry about, but, uh, if I'm trying to, if I'm thinking about my customers and I'm thinking about my process, right. And that was a big ERP thing. You know, was SAP, or, you know, I think it was SAP was one of the first that came. I was like, we're thinking about the order to cash process. Stop thinking about accounting or accounts receivable. Think about this process. Right. And that was a mind shift to break stuff up. Um, so, you know, if we want to bring more analytics into our, our, our system, uh, you know, I've gone in and said, you know what, let's try a cross-functional team. We're going to take five people for six months. And I want, you know, I want to go across the silos. I want a couple guys from the data team, a couple engineers uh, from the, the, you know, uh, that are currently in the full stack team. And I want two front-end engineers and oh, by the way, let's grab a product manager or actually let's just grab a category manager out of, you know, this retail category. And I get this look like you're nuts, right? Let's just keep optimizing everybody's process. And I'm like, no, 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 we're going to invent something new. We're going to take a team. We're going to let them go for, you know, four months and see how far they get on this idea. Uh, but it's got to be a cross-functional team. Well, why can't we just use what the data guys produce today? I'm like, well, how would we know if we want to tweak it differently? And do the front end engineers really understand how the data is produced? Well, they can look it up. We'll just have a meeting. And so I come back to the, and I'm sure you've done this, you know, or heard this said a couple of times. We're going to take a, take a team. We can even call it two pizza team. We're going to take a team and we're going to go see what they can invent uh, and see how far this idea goes. So I think that, that, that mission piece is how is the team clear on its mission Mm -hmm. and what it delivers for customers. Because if you're not clear on that, you almost want to go back to your, that's the boundary, right? Um, especially running detail page, man, everybody had a detail page idea of what was going to be a better shopping experience for their category and what I should work on. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, I'm like, I need to drive conversion at the platform level and components that help all of you optimize conversion in your category. Assuming conversion is the objective function, people buying more on that magic money button. So I'm going to worry about how well am I enabling you and how well am I driving the number of successful experiments that I can do on the detail page. But that took about six months to kind of really listen to my customers, my internal Amazon customers, and work with my team to go, why does it feel like hand-to-hand -hand combat to listen to everybody's idea and then tell them no uh, versus we have a system? And it was because we had lost track of what we did for our customers, our internal customers, and what our, our, our mission was um, as a detail page. Yeah. It wasn't clear. Well, this is, a good, this is a good opportunity to talk about being, being a dependency. In other words, so much of Amazon, so much of the book that we were just talking about working backwards written by my old boss and one of his colleagues, and so much of what we're talking about emphasizes getting rid of dependencies. So let me just give some framework real quick. Yeah, First, two pizza teams was this idea that small teams are more efficient, that everyone can sit in a room and have a mind share. And so Amazon had a model that they've moved away from in part called two pizza teams, the idea that no team should be bigger than what can be fed by two pizzas. Um, and these were kind of large pizzas and people with small appetites, at least compared to a lot of engineers I know. Um, and so the idea was about 10 people. So you'd have like a product manager, a program manager, a software dev manager, and like six or seven uh, engineers, total of about 10. Um, and they wanted the leader to be this renaissance man or woman who knew some business, knew some tech, was all over the place, uh, had skills in everything, design, good business judgment, all kinds of things. Second, um, Amazon ran into this problem as we grew, and I got there right as this was happen, happening, which is everything was tightly coupled. And so I remember when I was trying to launch Amazon Video, what's now Prime Video, um, that the problem with Prime Video, we needed to modify the Amazon catalog, uh, you know, the, the, the thing that stores all the items that's for sale. 
And when we first talked to the guy who owned the catalog team, he told us there was a year and a half wait to do anything to the catalog. And obviously you can't move fast or be agile if you have a dependency that's got a year and a half wait. Now, I have no idea how many clients the detail page had, but it had to be hundreds. And so you were in the position to be that. Sorry, go ahead. I'm talking over you. At any given month, Ethan, I was a bottleneck. There were, yeah. uh, across the course of a month, 1,100 engineers from other teams were making code changes in detail page code. And and hundreds of P&Ls across the company were dependent on code changes. Um, yeah, so say a little more about that. Um, say a little more about what you tried to do or what you learned or what you would recommend to others when you are in a situation where you have so many clients banging on your door because you become a central bottleneck because that should be interesting for and how should people deal with a bottleneck team besides just being better at whining or demanding than others uh more scotch and bribery no um you know which that is not a bad approach (laughs) by the way being Being honest like relationships and but go ahead Uh, yeah my team absolutely preferred working with partners uh, more than other partners because uh, relationships matter. Uh, but, you know, what has to happen is you run into back alley deals and how do you get resources? And, and that, that's not durable. So that's not going to last. Um, I th- no, but and- if I can inter- interject for one second, there is a reality that I want everyone to get out of this, which is relationships matter in business. And if you're good at building those relationships and having a positive, let me help you, you help me kind of relationship. Um, these teams that are in demand, they have no way to win. They can't meet everyone's demands. And so given they're going to disappoint some people, they'd rather help their friends and disappoint the people who annoy them. That's just human nature. And so there is you know, uh, the body language coming through the camera here, just, he just keeps going like this, like, yep. And just <laughs> realize that's true. And so um, when you're working with a team that's overstressed, uh, I talk about it a lot in the context of working with recruiters because recruiters always have more demand, you know, find me this, find me that. Sure. Sucking yeah. up to them in a positive way. Uh, works pretty well. I would work recruit and say, I want to be your best partner. How yeah. can I help you get your job done better? By the way, I don't expect that you're going to help me staff all my positions because uh, I need to contribute not only to you, but I-, I know you have a lot of demand. So I'm going to be working along with you to find my people. But what inputs can I do to take load off your back? You need bar raisers, uh, you know, on other loops. Um, great. My team will help you with that. Right. So how can I contribute to, to do that? And, and I'll come back to that. That was a key flip I made in, in how we organized, how we helped internal teams. Uh, but just for the context of the, the chat and the audience, I have yet to get to a client where um, they have a low backlog on a dependency team like this dependency problem. And I, I often regularly also hear about, oh, the BI team, they've got, they're, they're six months out. They can't take and, and then people just stop as if they think they have to wait for the BI team uh, to actually get to their priority request. And, and I'm like, well, what other levers do you have? Uh, can you collaborate with one of your customers? Can you outsource to a consultant? Um, you know, have you looked at all the things that are in your control? But if you're in this very functional silo mindset, uh, if you're not in an owner mindset, you're not thinking about all the levers you have at your disposal. Yep. Uh, you mentioned the relational thing, and I, I just for reference, you asked the book, uh, one of my favorite books in our last talk, Product Management, yeah. uh, in Managing Management Time, William Onken, you know, talks about, he probably spends a half a chapter on this, this relationship between suppliers, internal, when you're an internal group, you have suppliers and internal customers, and, and managing those like you would manage customer relationships. But that was key to detail page. So we looked and said, we have this many customers across the company. We can't meet all their requests. And we had this idea of, are we look, how should we look at this? So we actually benchmarked ourselves to, what if we were an AWS service? The amount of people that are putting code in and building on our stuff. And that was helpful for us as a ruler to get the right ruler or organizing structure to give us some ideas of how would we change. 
um, because we basically figured out, you know, when we benchmarked ourselves, we had more customers and more code changes than some of the AWS services that were out there, uh, at least the new ones, particularly. And so we started that helped us identify um, if we had manual interventions, if, if part of the process was somebody had to call me, uh, that was a broken process. Uh, like, we, how do we get out of the way of our customers? The second thing we, we realized, and that was true down the road, not just like calling me, but you know, we followed the principle of you get more of what you subsidize, less of what you penalize. So how do we subsidize instead of having office hours, which was subsidizing people coming to us uh, to get approval or not approval. Mm. We, we said, we're done with office hours. Here are our, here are our policies for, um, uh, and we revised a bunch of our policies for self-service. We also, you know, you have to support what you mandate. So when we mandated self-service, we very quickly prioritized on my team, the missing tools or the missing policies or the missing pieces that would enable our customers to do self-service. The next thing we did was we had gotten a lot of feedback that our decisions weren't transparent. And so rather than creating a big publishing arm to communicate out to all these people what our decisions were, because that's always going to be lagging. We published our decision criteria. We certainly published our monthly, our, our monthly business updates. Uh, which gave a little bit of our roadmap, but we focused more on making sure our customers understood our decision criteria, especially the contentious ones that were out of our hands. So we had a policy, you can't roll out a change. Um, you can't put a change in our software that slows the page down because Jeff said. <laughs> I remember this. It was such a nightmare um, because uh, the rule was, I mean, they measured this page. Okay, sorry. We got to step back in a couple of ways. First, I found a pain point on Ethan. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Very quickly, what was the Start name of the issue. book that you like so much again? William Onken. How do you Man managing management time? Managing management time. William Onken. Okay, so here's what um, when I first became aware of this, the detail page took like 12 seconds to load. It was huge. It was oh. very slow. Now the internet was slower, but it took 12 seconds. And I don't know when you got involved, but they set out to cut it in half. And the thing is, of course, people abandon pages. If you're waiting, you punch out. And that was lost sales. So they cut it in half to six seconds. And I don't, you might know how much should sales go up every, you know, do you have, it's a long time yeah. ago. So can we say yeah, anything about. A long time ago. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm not going to get specific, but, you know, just think of your phone. Uh, well, a couple of things. I got this baseball way to understand page speed is a uh, hundred mile an hour fastball is roughly 300 milliseconds. It's a third of a second. Um, you know, 90 mile an hour fastball is 350 to 400 milliseconds. An Amazon page, the target was one second page load. Yep, right? and it started at 12. And it started at 12. So on the, the P50 was one second, the P90 was two seconds. That's the target. And they're, they're pretty close to that, those targets, by the way, but you're starting at 12. Right, uh, and that was and probably P90. But yeah. then P90 means the 90th percentile. Because, of course, different people who are different distances from the server and blah, 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 get different page loads. If you and I load the same page, we won't get it in the exact same time. Right. So the 90th percentile, which is the last 10% of people, we're getting it in 12 seconds. Maybe the 50th percentile, we're getting it in five or six seconds or something. And by the way, this is why average is not useful. There's a lesson here Amazon has to share that they beat into us. We're giving away all the family jewels today on Amazon Wisdom. The average, suck. The average experience doesn't, because your average experience might be acceptable, two, three seconds. But your last 10 or 15% of customers are getting this horrible experience of 12, 15, 18 seconds, and they're abandoning. And that's 100% lost sales. Those might sales. be the customers with the money, right? Part of the reason averages suck is we're not producing identical bread loaves here. Right. You know, we don't know. Uh, we, you know, we're not trying to get everybody through the pipeline. We want to get the people who are going to buy today, get them yep. to the front of the line. Right. Yeah. So I, I cut in on you, but to finish this story, you're one team among thousands, uh, at least among hundreds who want to change this page. And the idea is I want to make a change. And if my change is going to inevitably add slowness, 
the challenge I was given was go find somewhere to make speed. And I'm like, how the <laughs> hell would I do this? I have no idea. I don't know any of these other teams. It was just, I mean, in a way I was being given an empowerment, like, oh, well, you can fix this yourself. Go figure out how to make the page faster. But in a way it's like, come on. I don't know what anybody else is doing to the page. That said, I want to say, Stefan, again, in terms of the family jewels, gave away the recipe for if you're a bottleneck team, you have to go to self-service. Yes. The, the first idea is always, oh, we'll prioritize. And prioritizing is good. But prioritizing is meaningless it's when you're so going to get to three things this month and you have a thousand requests. So then the second idea is always, let's make the team bigger. It'll do more. And you see his face again. The next thing is, oh, that's great. We'll double the team. It will get to six things of a thousand. So that doesn't work either. And so you have to break open the dam and say, you know what? Y'all do it yourself. But then we got to give you the tools and keep it safe. And so what Amazon has learned is, Self-service, self-service, self-service. And look, all of you are Amazon customers. And if you're not, shame on you. Get off my channel. Go be an Am Go buy something at Amazon and then come back here and you're welcome. No, only if you want to. It'll but bless you. Only if it serves you. Uh, but all of you are Amazon customers. And um, if you've ever had to return something, which most of you have, it's all self-service. You can click on the order. You can click on what you want to return. You can click on print the label. You can pick, click on have it picked up. Like, and that was all because just try and make it incredibly easy because we don't want to deal, um, you know, customer service calls. This is old data. This is way old. If you call customer service, it costs Amazon six bucks. This is old data. It's probably more now. If you email Amazon, it costs three bucks whatever we're selling doesn't have either a six dollar or a three dollar profit margin unless i mean unless you're buying a whole computer or something you're buying like a, a book or a movie or something small it doesn't have three bucks of profit in it so basically you emailing or calling us is like eating all the profit from your order and from like five other orders and so we wanted quite naturally to prevent that but yet we still, we're customer obsessed. We wanted you to get what you need, but never have to talk to us. Um, so Ethan, this is why it's so amazing to me right now. And I noticed this a couple of weeks ago, the customer service function for Amazon is now top navigation on the retail site. I'm like, holy cow, how are they making it so easy to contact Amazon? It's because they've gotten so good so right. good at can it. making it self-service so we can afford it solve your own problem yeah. um and so uh, as, as a bottleneck team this self-service is important scale doesn't work you know and i learned this in marketplace you know sebastian gunningham was the senior vice president of marketplace most interesting man alive um you know anybody whose bosses were jeff bezos larry ellison and steve jobs is a pretty interesting guy but you know he would regularly say look this third party marketplace is going to grow because sellers, hey, we're democratizing going and finding products that interest customers. And there's a lot more sellers than there are Amazon. So let's focus on enabling them. So that marketplace mindset, that AWS mindset is what I brought with me to be the detail bottleneck team, detail page bottleneck team. How do I empower my customers to contribute to the system? So the second thing I did, Ethan, is I would say, you know, hey, you've got a latency problem. We're not going to let you launch. Uh, by the way, I kept a record uh, or here is some, um, you know, we actually created trading credits. Uh, you know, we, we gave you a partner. You have a cap and uh, trade or, system, huh? Or we gave you a component and we just said, if you can work on this component, we'll take care of latency optimization. We just traded effort and we'd say, Ethan, you know, hey, can you help us with a couple, you know, improvements on this? We'll take care of the latency optimization to eat this up. Like we turned latency into effort. Um, and I just imported that on my team. But that was an enabling piece. The second thing we did was, you know, we created a portfolio balance of what should we work on. Uh, and and I, we pushed my team to work on the biggest impact stuff to lead by example. 
because if we just viewed our teams, our, the, the detail page team as um, we're building platform components and we're taking orders from all these dependency teams, we're always behind. And I push my team to say we're behind because people don't know what to copy. Nobody's setting an example of what would a great detail page, yep. what is the optimal reference implementation of a detail page? What's a great web lab look like? So we push the team of like, yes, 80% of our time is going to be on platform components, et cetera. But 20% of our time is going to be on showing uh, by example, what a great reference implementation is to give people something to follow, right? Show them what to copy. And where possible, when I had a team come in, they're self-serving. They're self the soft lines team comes in and says, we want to build a great apparel shopping experience. And inevitably they want to do something that there's no platform component for, right? So I can either make them wait or we got good at partial investments on company critical things. So clothing was a stated priority for Amazon. Consumables, yep. Yep. groceries, stated priority. So I said, you know what? I'm going to give you three people to this. Pro you know, again, I want to empower what I dictate. I want you to use the platform. I recognize there's a platform gap. Um, I want your architecture to be improving the ecosystem for everybody, but I don't want to slow you down. So I'm going to give you three people, four people as loaners from my team to help you architect and build the platform component so that we make sure you build on your timeline, but we build what I want, right? Yeah. And, now this is and, good leadership, right? Make it win-win to do the right thing. And that's, yeah. that's your team had to have enough resources to behave well, right. to not be a roadblock. Because Amazon teams, any leader, given a reasonable chance to... In, control their own destiny will bend over backwards to try and work with you. So this is part of, um, I want to talk a little bit more about good team structure and good leadership. Yeah. Stefan has given one idea of how a dependent team can serve its customers and give them pathways to success. You have to have a counterpart team um, that uh, is willing to invest. And chat says here, contribution must be rewarded. That's the trade-off, right? Is I get something I want, which is I get to launch without needing to understand latency across all these crazy variables. And Stefan and his team get something they want, which is they get infrastructure built that they need that they don't have time and resources for. And so it's a simple horse trade. Um, Not only is it a horse trade, but if you go your own way, right, and you build a non-standard component, I will penalize you. Hmm. So um, the other thing I put in place is you're welcome to go your own way but I am no longer gonna do the testing for you. I'm no longer gonna do the deployments for you. You own it all the way, right? And so removing kind of creating this like, so contribution doesn't have to be rewarded. Uh, Non-deviant behavior you don't want yep. does need to be penalized, right? Well, this, this is economics, that. right? If you want more yeah. of something, subsidize it. If you want less of something, tax it. Have some kids and you see how this works out too, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh that's man doing. yeah well you uh, <laughs> you have a big you have a big brood um it, i'm hard-headed it takes a lot to teach me yeah uh, well, so yeah. frustrating but you have to empower your whole team to make this decision because inevitably someone on a team comes to your your new software engineer and says can you just make it you know just take care of this for me right just do it and so there's leadership but you you have to give your team the clarity to do that um, and that was the piece where on detail page, we wanted to take the pressure off junior engineers. Last thing we did, Ethan, and this was a little disruptive. We wanted people to complain about us mm. because welcome we believed feedback. in, well, welcome feedback, but we also thought inspection brought relief. So we knew we were under-resourced, um, and oh. we knew we were confident that we had prioritized on good principle. We were, we were behind company winners. We were behind. Um, and so we thought if someone, we thought escalation was great because we couldn't add more resources to our team, right? And that was counterintuitive, right? It's like, well, just take care of them so they don't complain to the boss. And it's like, no, if you're on principle, like things are beyond your control. I couldn't go just hire more people. I'd hired up to my headcount, right? So... Um, if you don't like latency, I think I've given you good options. Please go complain, right? Because I'd love more people to help you. 
uh, or I'd love a policy change, right, yeah. to help. You. But it was also an empowerment to our team as a team behavior uh, that I find, like I, I started to push on my team. If I have two people at the same level who disagree and uh, they can articulate each other's position, if I don't hear about it in 20, and they're at a standstill, if I don't hear about it in 24 hours, they're now in trouble uh, because they're going to degrade relationships. Things are going to go sideways because they're probably facing a decision where there's either lack of clarity in role. Um, uh, they're, they're disagreeing on who owns the final decision. I own the software, so I own the final decision. Possession is nine tenths of the law. Uh, or um, uh, yep. possession or, is nine tenths of the law. You can't make me. <laughs> if I own the engineers, in the end, what I decide will get coded. Uh, or it's above their pay grade, right? Yeah. And so, um, you know, and, and, and they're stuck. Uh, and so we really pushed and that made everybody at first like, I don't want to escalate. I don't want to be the tattletale. I don't, you know, but it's how do you get your, empower your boss or the senior people on your team to help you? Um, and viewing that escalation as a way to help was a good team structure. Does our team have good escalation practices? Is our team regularly escalating? So this is, uh, this is another aspect of a good team to talk about for a minute. If you're in a uh, team where surfacing problems and discussing them in a positive way is penalized and like, don't rock the boat, you're in a bad team. Now, you need to be aware of, are you doing this politely? And are you do like, you need to first look at, Everyone, of course, believes that they're the nicest person and they're only putting forward rational arguments. But you should get some feedback on this because often you're an a-hole because I've been an a-hole much of my career. So I can say this with certainty. I used to have a saying, which is um, people call me a loose cannon, but that's only because they don't like it when I'm pointed at them. And that was clearly just covering for being a jerk. Um, so I had to learn and grow. But if you're in a situation where we're bringing problems to the team and to the leader and saying, look, I see a problem. Here's what I would propose to solve it, but I'm willing to pitch in on any solution. And they're like, why don't you shut up and get in your whole worm? It's time to come to one of our resume streams and polish up that resume and go somewhere else because other no. teams exist. Other teams exist at other companies that, that actually want you to think and contribute. The second thing Stefan said earlier was about empowering his team. So we were talking about what makes a good team Look, we talked about extreme ownership. We've talked about that before. You need owners on a team and you need everyone uh, to feel like they have autonomy to do the right stuff. Um, and if two people reasonably disagree, sometimes you make choices. There is more than one way to build things. There's more than one way to get systems to work. And so sometimes you just need to make a choice. Your proposal will work. My proposal will work. You know, if I want Mexican for dinner tonight and you want Italian, it doesn't mean that Mexican is bad and Italian is good. It means we have to come to some accommodation, right? Our family dinner plans, I'm sharing very broadly here, is pizza tonight <laughs> and curry tomorrow. And we that's true, by the way. And we like both of those. And there are ways, you know, but... There's nothing wrong with pizza, even though I like curry slightly more. Well, Boy, that's tough, but I like them both. Um, the point is, when we talk about what makes a great team, you need these components and you need a leader. One of the things we haven't talked about yet is to let leaders evaluate the leader you're working for. People leave jobs. By the way, 70% of the reason people leave a job is over their direct manager. They don't always say that on the way out the door. But if you call them up two years later and say, hey, why did you leave Acme Inc.? Why did you quit? Why did you move on? Even at the time, if they said, well, my wife this or we were moving or compensation, two years later, they'll say, I hated Fred. Fred drove me nuts. Um, so be aware, if you have a manager who's not leading well and you don't see them changing or listening and you can't have a conversation with them, Yep, it's time to move uh, in the company, out of the company. Now, Edgy would, and some others in chat have said, well, can you always choose your team? It depends. In hard economic times, you may need a job, depending on your skill level and your industry. 
uh, my stream on Thursday is going to be about career change. It's going to be about designing your next career step with another Amazon guest. Um, and we're going to talk about how do you design where you're going next and how do you plan and plot and get there. You may be stuck short term. If you have the wrong skills and it's a hard economy, you may be lucky to have the job you have and you may need to suck it up. But that doesn't have to be the people who listen to this channel. And I've said this before. You, you're educated, you speak English because you're listening to someone who speaks English. You have access to a computer, you have free time, you're, you, you have all these assets, you can go anywhere if you want. And it's just a matter of time. You may need to suck it up for a year, even two years, but then you can be on this path to freedom. So I'm, I'm going to take a breath and let Stefan riff on what I've said, but if you, if you need to make a move, and on the other hand, if you're on a team that lets you do this and you're under a good leader, cling to that leader and thrive. And that's where you apply the magic loop that I've talked about many other times. So back to you, ball to you. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to take that, that and yeah. just kind of riff on it for a minute. Cause I had you know privilege of working for a number of vice presidents at Amazon, uh, all of which were quite different personalities. And, and I would, you know, people would ask career guidance, like, when, when should I leave a team? When's too soon? And yeah. we don't unpack that yeah. a little bit. I'm like, I'm like, my gating function, my rate limiter is you're free to leave when you've made an appropriate contribution for your level. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, for a director or VP, your job is that's probably going to be two to three years because you, you need to set a strategy and put an organization in place. That's what you do. And that will take time. You're straight out of college. You might have made a contribution in 60 days, right? Congratulations. You've punched your ticket to be able to go somewhere else. But I, I would, I picked my leader and I was more concerned about my leader than I was about uh, the, uh, than I was about the specific functional area within Amazon. Well, there's things I wanted to learn, you know, uh, I wonder who am I going to learn from? And the nature of the organization will take on the nature of the leader, what they, what they permit or what they don't. Now, couple times I was moved under a leader. And um, uh, so this leader is uh, very professional, was a good, was, uh, was a good leader. Uh, well, sorry, they, they were very accomplished. They got a lot done, but their, their manner and personality style just made me cringe every day. And it's not because they were a bad human. They're just a very different person than I do, than I am. And the first time I worked for them, <laughs> it was really frustrating. But I came back around because uh, there was an interesting opportunity and I could work for, uh, and I, I worked for this person the second time uh, because I had learned how to create um, the best, use the best of this person to help me and how I could actually help them. Um, but I also knew there were some, I put some guardrails and I was very upfront about it. I'm like, if this starts happening, I'm out. Mm -hmm. right? Um but I was able to come in the second time. So I recognized it was not actually competence or capability. It was personality. Style. They weren't a bad manager. It was style. And their style was very different than mine. Um, and, and there's other things I could poke on. I mean, they had their weaknesses in their competence. And we all do, right? You're but not going to find a perfect boss. If you're looking for a boss yeah. who's perfect all the time, forget it. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> guess what? You're not going to find them. So I did want to put that on that one person or team. It's not necessarily you have a bad boss. You're also free to leave if you've, you've made your contribution. Mm -hmm. And I would extend that across the team, like good teams. Um, you know, I love the movie draft day, just, you know, that general manager perspective of how he's kind of intersecting the team. You get, you know, what do you need? Right. Uh, and that personalities capabilities beyond job description and the opportunity to grow and learn within a team is the team pulling together. Um, so I've been having a lot of conversations with hiring managers as well. And they're like, oh, we need to add this. Uh, we need to add this to our team. And I'm like, let's break that down. Do you need more capacity on your team? Do you need particular skills on your team? Or do you really need a person on your team? Right. You don't need to hire. You need to get more work done. Uh, or you need to get a new kind of work done. Mm -hmm. So let's look at all the levers to do that in your team. Maybe we should. You just found a great person, but you're not hiring them because they don't have exact role fit. Well, would they make your team better? Um, I did have one point Amazon, just because it's a funny story, I'll share it for the channel. I had a manager come to me and be like, I've got this new engineer, he's joining your team in two weeks. You need to get somebody off your team so you have a head count to put them on. And uh, this wow. is early days, very different. Uh, and, and I came back and he's like, look, 
here's your job description. It says, make your team better. That's your job. I'm giving you American baseball moment. I'm giving you, and it tells you how old it is. I'm giving you a rod. You need to take one of your little leaguers and say, Hey, there's lots of jobs at Amazon. Let me help you find one. Uh, because you're bringing a rod to your team. But what he was poking me on was, and, and also he was helping me set up the team with the right composition. We were starting, we knew we were coming into going to be a really hard CS problem. And he knew we were going to need someone with the confidence and thought leadership. And it actually turned out to be a great thing for the other people on the team because they then had a mentor and a, a kind of tutor to learn from. So he was pushing me and, and the edges of it may sound mean and kind of make a fun story. By the way, another person went on and did great things in a different team. So it works out. It's convenience of Amazon. But, um, you know, thinking about the composition of the team and sharing work and growing, I think, Ethan, I'm just kind of riffing on that for a minute, was something that I thought about as we were hiring. Don't get stuck into we need someone just like that other person uh, or we need to fill this one person role. Uh, most of the teams are executing as a team. Uh, and, and so, you know, when I look at well-functioning teams, you know, I look at some of those intersections and do people pick up the in-between tasks, right? Uh, not everybody's going to be at the same level, uh, you know, when it comes to a team, uh, and, and what's expected on the team. I was, um, I was talking on a different channel. I tried to train my team on inputs. So it was also in job descriptions. And I don't know if you remember this, you know, an L7 is expect, an L6 is expected to be able to write for a VP at Amazon, a level right. six person, which yeah. is, a, is two levels up. That's oh, a right. standard product manager is an L6 and they're supposed yeah. to be able to write three levels up, right? right. Seven, to eight, 10 to a VP. Yeah. And then a, an L7 senior product manager. So the next level up is supposed to also be able to do three levels up. Mm. And I had, my assistant was working with me on my calendar time and she's like, well, do you want to review this paper? Cause you know, uh, she was doing a great job helping me make sure we, we inspected before we went to a, a senior vice president. And I'm like, no. And she's like, uh, are you sure? And she was uncomfortable on my behalf and she hadn't worked with me that long. And she's like, you know, you've had four or five papers and you've only, you've only reviewed one of them. And I'm, and so I went back and I'm like, look, your manager should be training you to be able to do your job. I've worked with these guys and, 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 and men and women on the outline, on the opening paragraph, and I've tested them previously. I know they can take it the last mile. Now, if this other person was writing the paper, I'll work with them a little more closely because they don't have as much experience. But the, I got the feedback that was you know unusual, but your manager on a good team should be giving you, I think should be giving you capabilities not just helping you solve the problem of the day. A good manager should be teaching at all times. Uh, I've talked to a number of leaders um, and I, I, well, I'll run this by you. At the end of your career, how much of your job was teaching? Oh, 80, 90%. Right. It, it was either teaching or it was, I would call it statesmanship. Uh, mm -hmm. I was you know, working with other leaders at similar levels, sometimes teaching on different things or just are we winning helping each other win okay yeah i agree so um the the mentoring teaching showing by example that that's the full-time job of a higher level leader in particular so if you don't see your leaders around you teaching that's another sign to get out of dodge if you do it's a sign to stay in dodge um as long as you can because good leaders are rare I'll, I'll match your leadership story with a funny one of my own. It comes from a, a friend of mine uh, that I hired. He's still at Amazon. I hired him all 13, 14 years ago. So he's had a long run. But he was telling a story that, um, look, the fact is Amazon hires a lot of people who've gone to very good colleges. They generally, to get into those colleges, they generally have money or opportunity. They come in. They're doing well. They're going to a top tier school. So they're going to an MIT, a Waterloo in Canada, somewhere great. And then they're coming to Amazon. So their life is on rails, right? They're coming from a family that could provide them, uh, you know, lived in a good neighborhood and had great education. Then they went to a great college. Then they're coming to a great company. They do sometimes come with a lot of entitlement. He recruited in a couple people or got in a couple people from, I don't know what the program's called, Stefan, you may know. 
But Amazon has a program now that cross trains people from other professions into software development. And he hired in a couple of the first people from this, which were single moms coming from non-professional work in their 30s or 40s into software. Okay, so Rico has added it. It's Amazon Tech Academy. And so this is like a cross-training program to be engineers. And it turns these people who have other skills and are often far into their careers into SDE1s, which is the same as our college graduates. Um, and the funny thing about it is these people were gold in the team because from a team dynamics viewpoint, you had some people who were like, well, Amazon doesn't provide very good snacks and there's no on-site massages. <laughs> and these people who had been in other roles, whatever it was, maybe selling real estate or childbirth. Um, what? Childbirth. Yeah. Or childbirth <laughs> or whatever. We're like, Okay, son, I have a boy almost your age, and we're going to have a little bit of come to Jesus moment here about maybe you ought to just realize how hard the world is. And it was just great because it wasn't coming from the boss then. It was someone else saying, you know, I can't speak for you, but I am freaking glad to have this job because it beats so much. You know, I was a nurse's assistant changing bedpans. I was working you know the front desk at a hotel to get by and now i'm sitting in a nice corporate office with air conditioning building something people will really use surrounded by great colleagues get a fucking grip and Perspective matters and the boss can't say that right like the boss can't say that but coming from a peer gold. so that's that's what i mean even as a boss like i would yeah, you know, we talked about this a little bit last time. You know, having a book list is one thing, but can I create a team that creates learning within each other? And can I build that mix of team? When I looked at teams, I would try to, uh, you know, I would look at my teams and I would try to get at least one of my. So I had managers of managers as well as team, but I looked for a mix both in my managers and my teams of Amazon Amazon expertise. I wanted some tenure. I wanted some old fart. Um, you know, people have been around for a while. I wanted some brand new, right? Because even if they've been around for a while, like want to keep reminding people to audit what they think they know is true. Right. And so new people kind of test that, you know, I wanted different walks of life. Um, and so, you know, maybe that's me, you know, I, I'm, I come a little bit non-traditional, not a ton, but a little bit. Um, and those, I found the teams, like, how could they do? So if you have a book list as a team, you're reading, that's just one way to be a learning team. Right. Hey, we're going to have a lunch this month. We all picked a book. OK, but everybody come with one idea they thought was great and an idea they'd like to try. And oh, by the way, can you lead this book group? And I delegate that. I delegated my staff meeting. Right. Um, you know, I'm going to test this person to lead among their peers. Uh, but you can create that. Obviously, I was just a manager. But yeah, I love that. I love the, the, the grit and mom story because bringing those different perspectives. It's like, hey, we're going to make the team better. And something. The team so there's there. Zealous, I'll run right? this by you, right? Let's be honest. Would you rather have someone on your team who's slightly more brilliant but thornier, or someone who's slightly less brilliant but super eager to help and and to bring the team up? Yeah, I take character and attitude every day. Yeah, every day and twice on Sunday. So in my product manager, I, I may have mentioned it last time, right? Uh, you know, a third of the product managers my team did not have an MBA. Right. Uh, they had gained those skills somewhere else, but they and and they outperformed on some other dimension. They knew how to execute, or they were way deep in analytics. But they had they had earned their stripes doing something else. And so even when I'm resume screening for the team, I'm looking at is this person a learner? Does this person show? So my resume screen for the channel for fun, even though it's a different thing, I would look for demonstrated success in multiple in in different. Uh, industries or disciplines, because that gave me a signal of were they a first principles person? Uh, did they understand first principles? Second thing I'd look for is did they have different size of organizations? Had they been in a startup and a big company uh, or something small and big, small business, even better? Because again, I'm looking for that sense of, you know, do they know how to pick up the trash, take out the trash? And do they also know how to communicate with multiple business units? Uh, and then I would look for uh, other symbols of grit, you know, 
they're from the Midwest and they deal with a foot of snow uh, before they go to school or, you know, um, and that's just what I tested for. Right. Uh, they, you know, competence is what I'm looking for, but character you know, is going to be part of the team. Um, I mentioned draft day, but Mike Ruzioni was critical uh, to the 1980 U S Olympic hockey team. Why? He had a lot of brothers and cousins. Um, he wasn't the top skilled player. Somehow he became the captain, right? Uh, he didn't score that much, but he scored the winning goal, right? He knew how to drive people uh, and make good relationships. And he was competent enough, right? He wasn't incompetent to be on the team, uh, but it makes a difference. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so good teams know how to value all the different pieces, not just getting the job done. The thing I wanted to poke on a little bit, Ethan, is yeah. um, you know, we were at Amazon with single-threaded leaders. Yes. Right? And, and there's other ways of organizing a team, two in a box, or, and I'm not as familiar with that. Do you pretty much always recommend single-threaded leaders? Um, you know, or how do you think about that as you've looked at things at Twitch or you know, other different places? Is that really just Amazon's, it's the only way to go, but they can do it? Uh, okay, so let's define it first for people who may not know, because most people here aren't Amazon. Yep. So single-threaded leader means this. It means a leader only works on one project. It follows the, if you've read the book Extreme Ownership, it's not an Amazon-only idea. Extreme Ownership is the two Navy SEALs, um, Jocko Willink and Leif Babin, who talk about SEAL leadership. And the idea, though, is work on your highest priority. You should know what your main problem is. And at Amazon, the idea was uh, the quote that really is telling is the best way to fail at inventing something is to make it someone's part time job. And so what we found at Amazon was if you gave someone several jobs. Often they would focus on whichever one of those had the loudest people yelling about it or had the quickest, easiest results. And they would naturally deprioritize something. Um, and they weren't wrong to do this. The problem was where it breaks down is, I'll give a simple example. Amazon started as a bookstore. It grew big, somewhat big, selling books. Then they want to start selling CDs. Well, if you make selling CDs part of the book guy's job, he has a devil's choice. I can make a change in how we sell books and that will make an extra million dollars today. Or I can make a change to support how we're going to sell music and that will make maybe a million dollars tomorrow. What we learned is you need to have someone worried about making books better who's moving as fast as he can to pick up the million dollar book opportunities and have someone else who's all about how we're going to build a big music business someday. So that's and Amazon's answer to this was to have single threaded leaders. Now, is single threaded always right? Well, first, the idea of single threaded, by the way, was that these people would have all the resources they needed to pursue their business. But this was never quite completely true because the warehouse was the same. So you didn't have two separate warehouses. You didn't have a book warehouse and a music warehouse. And this those annoying detail page guys, those annoying know. detail page guys, you had to display it on the same pages because you didn't want a music page to look completely and come totally different than a book page because it would confuse the hell out of customers and on and on and on. So the first thing to realize is Amazon talks about this single threaded idea. It is good to have a leader focused on a project and a team focused on a project. But you have to decide what's in the single thread, which is a computer science term, the single focus and what's not. And the second thing you have to decide that I ran into more is how do those single threaded leaders grow? Who manages them? Because you can be obsessive about it um, and like, oh, well, everybody's supposed to be single threaded. Well, what do you do when somebody's assignment they're bigger than that single assignment. On the one hand, they're doing good work. On the other hand, they're ready to grow. Do you lose them? And so where I wrestled with it most, and you asked the question, I'm just going to reflect back to you. Where I wrestled with it most was with leaders who wanted to grow and who were ambitious. And I, they were killing it, but they seemed like they could do more. So I don't know. What do you think? Um, well, I think there's... The, the challenge that I've been finding with the idea of single threaded leadership 
is has been one about size and scale. So with some of the, the smaller uh, businesses that I've been working with, or even in my own, you know, the startup as we're starting to look at, think about our hires, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the old adage of, Hey, you're going to have a hundred things that you need that you're told to do. Five of them need to get done. You're only going to have time for three. That's a success secret to success to Amazon, figure out how to handle that. Uh, that's where I run into a challenge of a single threaded leader doesn't work. Um, in the smaller organizations, it's because, Hey, you know, there's only 10 people in the tech team. They have five products. It's really only two people per, per product. Like, you know, and they probably do need to have five, like, you know, we'll ignore the constraints and revisiting them. You know, let's just assume they're all valid for a minute. Uh, so a single threaded leader, all of a sudden you have five teams of two. Um, yeah. And one person, like it, it, it starts to break down at that size. They don't have all the resources. And then the second you know, piece on it. So size is one resource is another. Um, and then, you know, as, as I've thought about what I love about it and what did work is again, I always work with my team about scale. I'm like, if you're doing the same job, so with leaders that want to grow, I'm like, if you're doing the same job again next year or the next time the cycle comes around, you failed. Yeah. Uh, because you didn't scale the business grew 20%. Um, you should be training someone behind you so that you can take on more. Right. Now, whether I always had more to give, that was a different problem uh, and where I ran into trouble. Um, and that was okay. Sometimes we just export it. Like I encourage people to do two things just to tie this back to the team for a minute and I'll come back to single third leader. One is I personally looked around once a year and if I saw something that was attractive to me outside my team, I tried to change my role or talk to my boss about whether I could add it in. So I want, I, one year I saw data science everywhere. I said, I want to start learning about data science. And I went to my VP and he's like, you need a data science team. Let's give you one, right? And I encourage my people to do the same because again, on, on the leadership front, I'm like, look, I want to help you meet your career goals, hopefully on this team, but let's plan it together. And so I think that single threaded leader piece, while I like it in, in theory, and I do think it can work more places because it forces a prioritization. Um, I, I, I struggle with the, how do you keep pushing innovation with someone who, who you can't split off the devil's choice. They've got to do both. They've got to operate today at scale and they have to solve their own innovators dilemma. Yeah. And so where, look, where it was good, it worked a hundred percent of the time where, where a priority objective was not getting attention and you just needed to carve off people who didn't have to worry about the big P and L today to work on the future P and L that worked. And, Look, Jeff made uh, a choice at Amazon, which is he was willing to accept inefficiency to have faster speed. So part of what people always argue is, oh, having all these single teams and all these separate resources is very, very expensive. Jeff's theory, which has worked in Amazon, is to go faster is worth being redundant. Amazon is one of the most redundant places in many ways you would ever see. Things get rebuilt all the time. And he, I go ahead. Two is greater than zero. Two is great. Yeah. So this is one of his great equations. Uh, Jeff had an argument with a guy who was trying to say you have so much redundancy. And after arguing and arguing, the guy finally wrote um, or kept saying, well, why are you allowed this? And Jeff finally said two is greater than zero, which is he'd rather fund two teams and get two products than try and make them coordinate and be, an e be efficient and end up with zero. And so that philosophy has worked. Now, all of you have heard this in different ways. Fail fast, fail forward, speed matters, speed is life. There's lots of ways to say it. Amazon has proven to some degree that trying to move faster at the cost of efficiency can work as a strategy. And that's the two is greater than zero. The thing I wanted to say here to the point of growth and people should grow in their jobs, I, I threaten in chat, you can't see it, Stefan. I threaten in chat, um, I'm going to challenge software engineers. I had software engineers come to me all the time and say, my work is boring. It's repetitive. It's not challenging. I keep having to make these changes in code and it's beneath me. I don't like this, blah, blah, blah. And um, being a good boss who was evil and had lots of time to think, I said, okay, I have a challenge for you. If it's so effing easy, then you should be able to automate it. 
build a tool, make it self-service. And uh, if you're now going to, if you're just about to tell me, well, that's really hard, blah, 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 then it's not that easy. So I kind of have you screwed here. The thing, it's either you can automate it. Like I'm going to give you all bad choices. Either it's not that easy and you're whining or it is that easy and you can automate it, in which case I'll let you do something else, please. Or uh, you're not good enough to automate it. So you go ahead and let me know like which one of those and I'll work for you there. So that's my evil pointy haired boss, Dilbert boss uh, for the moment. And that worked pretty well. Uh, we had people... someone who worked for both of us uh, in, and, you know, if he was with us right now, he'd tell that story. Uh, he came to me and said, you know, I've just got too much on my plate. And I'm like, fantastic. I'm giving you more. Uh, here you go. Uh, and, and, yep. you know, we went through the, the piece of where it was. I'm like, I don't think you're good at prioritizing and I don't think you're sufficiently delegating. And I think, you know, I'm like, you know, the, the software engineering maxim of laziness and patience and hubris. I think you need to practice that a little more, right? Uh, the answer to people having trouble prioritizing is not taking stuff off their plate. It's often adding more. Overload yeah. them till they crack. Yeah, well, uh, until yeah, they have really, to innovate, till yes. they have to become efficient. Yeah, and so as a team, you know, one of the things I've been trying is I've been trying to explain a team structure where we can't quite afford a single-threaded leader. I'm like, you guys should should try a Quidditch approach. Uh, and, and I'm like, you got to try to get the game done with you know, uh, a little bit less than player and you need to send somebody off chasing the snitch. And so I'll ask the team, like, who's chasing the snitch on your team? Um, you guys talk about you want to start doing more AI on your team and you're not doing any. Um, who are you sending off to experiment uh, with that? Right. Go chase the snitch um, and find the efficiencies uh, to do that. Um, but it's it's uh, I'm still trying to figure out uh, more effective ways, haven't solved it, just trying stuff. When I don't have the resources with a client to, to apply a single threaded leader, how do I get them a first step of the way? Or when I've got a small team, how do I help them still break up that innovator's dilemma uh, to get faster progress and focus? All right. So how do you feel about, uh, people have been asking if we're gonna take questions. How do you feel about seeing what's what's tops on the question list? Sounds great, I love questions. Good, well, I'm, I'm gonna see what pops up here. Uh, I'm gonna play window management just a second. I have a seven-year-old with special needs. I get questions all day. <laughs> and they're interesting, they're super fun. You know, it's I, I have, I have uh, someone who works for me, is, his daughter has downs. Yeah. And uh, yeah. she's, oh, is that the same for you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you do get questions all day then. <laughs> uh, totally get it. So we don't have too many questions in here. Um, so if folks, if you want to put them in or if you want to vote on anything, we'll take a couple. But I, I usually, my rule is if it doesn't have more than one vote in our question tool and there's 120 of you watching, if only one person wants to talk about it, you know, we're not going to talk about it. Um, but the first question is, how does one highlight character and attitude on a resume? So Stefan, you mentioned this trait. Now you go, how, how do you do that? You know, when I see, there's things I might see on a resume, right? And, and you mentioned earlier, like some, um, you know, hey, Harvard offers a great education and not everybody has the opportunity to get there, but Harvard does some screening. So, you know, sometimes they may also pick up some people who've had a lot of opportunity and they have entitlement perspective. The military, uh, the United States military, other military, it's hard. <laughs> it's a lot of push-ups, um, and you have to learn some humility. So chances are, if I see military uh, on experience on someone's resume, um, that you know they've done some hard things. Now on a resume, it's just a signal. Um, it may be noise. It may not. It's not. A, it's not proof of anything any more than you know, a Harvard MBA, maybe someone who's awesome, it may not be a good fit to Amazon or to a role I'm hiring for. So, uh, you know, military can be a, things that you've done that are hard or maybe unique uh, or repetitive. Um, you know, travel, uh, not all travel is easy. Uh, and so I'm not sure if my resume would scream grit, but uh, if, you, if you've lived in a certain place, so I went to school in Michigan in the snow and walked uphill uh, a mile each way, uh, so when I see different parts of the country, I have some in parts of the world, 
I may be able to check that. Oh, um, so I, I, I will say something now. I've had a lot of my new dark rye <laughs> that I've never said before. And it's super controversial. And I couldn't say if I work for Amazon. And I want to circumspect this very, very carefully. And I was younger when I said this, but I think I still live by it. So I once asked the question, if I was only only allowed to know one thing about a candidate, one thing, and that thing, you're, you're wondering what is that one thing? I'll let you answer that. The one thing in my case was where is the candidate from? They are an engineer because that's what I do. And they're either from America. They're an American born, American educated engineer, or they are an Indian born, Indian educated engineer. And this is the only thing I'm allowed to know. Who would I hire? And now that I don't have to, you know, Amazon would be sued for this. Any company would be sued for it. And luckily, see, I was never forced to make this choice. But I would hire the Indian-born engineer blind if I was forced. Because they got to America through a generally much harder road. And my experience was, look, Americans don't want to don't want to become engineers they want to become lawyers doctors wall street bankers something else um and of course it depends on an individual basis individuals are different and by the way i am a fucking american born engineer so it's not that i don't like myself it's simply that i saw people with more grit and challenge yeah it, you know i climbing I, up from harder circumstances yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't have it that hard, but you know, I was, you know, the first in, in my family to go to college. I paid my own way. Uh, I walked in snow, you know, it still wasn't that hard. right? Um, it wasn't that hard to pay my own way in the United States. It, it, you know, uh, and so that, that ability of like, are they going to work? Like, where's the, the work um, piece of it? So, you know, back to the question too, I, I look also for other interests, right? Um, and other interests can be that, a symbol. Yeah. Because they still who you are. Yeah. Other interests, hunger, the did someone overcome you, adversity. Yeah. The I, roles you took in organizations um, or the X, like, are you, you know, so there's an interesting, I don't know if you've ever read the captain's class uh, as a book. Um, you know, he, he, it's a really fun book, by the way. He, he does an analysis of what are the best sports team of all times? In the first chapter, very Amazon style, he throat explains. Which book is like, this? Sorry, it's called the Captain's Class. The Captain's Class. Come. Okay. And uh, he, in the first chapter, even the introduction, he kind of adjusts and defends why he uh, throws out all the other studies. Some of them are, are, are rankings of best sports teams. Some of them are regional specific. They're gender biased. They're age biased. And so then what he's trying to do is he's saying, what are the attributes that have made the best sports team of all time? And obviously the, the, the giveaways in the title. So, you know, he dispels some myths. It's about the coach. It's about the money. Um, but one of the things he articulates in there is the captains of these most dominant sports teams of all time. Um, most of them were not, ex were not the, the all-star. Michael Jordan's teams don't make it. Um, they were good, but they weren't necessarily a superstar. Uh, second is they didn't usually lead the team in the marquee, uh, the marquee KPI. They were usually serving in some part. You know, Bill Russell led in assists a lot more than he led in points. He led in assists and rebounds. Uh, you know, more often he led in points, but his his Celtics were you know one of the dominant teams. And and then this grit capability comes through of, of they are you know they are working and driven. Um, and, and so it's interesting to see in these, like in a team, in a well-performing team, you know, it's going to be elevated by someone, even if it's just one, like that single mom who, you know, earned her way into the future tech program. Yeah, the, the, absolutely. The one person can set a team's, one or two people can set a team's culture positively oh. and negatively. Um, Bank and, one, uh, you know, people in chat are talking about moving to the West coast, for example. Um, and I, you know, I made the move to the West Coast as well, and it turned out to be great for me also. And um, 
throughout history, people have migrated for opportunity. This is a sidebar, okay? Since I'm on all kinds of rants today. So, you know. Sidebar on our immigration policy. Uh, America has been insane my entire life uh, to limit the number of people. This is the dumbest equation on earth. Let's let some other country or culture pay to college educate someone who then wants to move here and we say no. All the investment in this person is done. And now the expense has been paid and we're going to turn their ass down. Uh, This is not the solution. Now, I understand Americans need jobs and there are problems in America. So I'm not stupid about that either. But there is a better way to solve this than refusing to take the incredibly valuable young asset that some other country has constructed and put it to work in our country. And by the way, that person is probably going to go back to the other country and create jobs. Sure. Also Uh, true. And God bless them. I want them to or send money home. But but they can also create those jobs here, right? Chances are they're a job creator, not a job creator. Uh, look, I can't solve all political problems. If we need to tax some people or whatever so that Americans also get education and have jobs and whatever, fine. But to turn down the chance to to skim the cream of the crop from every other country on earth, uh, like, no. <laughs> and and yeah. look, that's just xenophobia. Um, it's It's literally just um it's it's nuts you know i, I those symbols to, to the question uh yeah because i i could rant with you for a while on that believe you me uh the symbols of the question I'm, I'm just looking for early things that i can then i'm going to keep testing like as we discuss in the interview process etc oh, he's back answering the actual question good man keep going but well i mean and so i would you know i would joke and i'd even say to Amazon, i'm like i hire midwestern canadians because i know they're going to get to work in snow right uh, or I'm going to also hire some people from other countries. I'm with you on the India engineer because they're also going to get here in snow unless I tell them, just please stay home, uh, dial into VPN uh, because they know like, it's work, right? And, you know, I've been asked to do it. It's a privilege. Uh, and, and I'm going to come meet that privilege to come to work. You know, this so if we can this. open up that privilege to more people, I'm, I'm with you on the question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and so the- somebody in chat, uh, one of our longtime regulars is saying, uh, sounds rather prejudiced, Ethan. Don't you want to allow other nations to profit from their work? I assume you're joking, but if you're not, uh, if you're dead serious, hey, they should retain, you know, that's a separate question. That's about them keeping their people. The thing I addressed is our policy of us keeping them out. Right. And that's foolish. If someone has decided they want to move here, and they're look, Canada does this right, by the way. Canada, I believe, so it's probably some Canadians. Well, Edgy might know others. There's some other Canadians here. Basically, as I understand it, if you have a college degree from a real college accredited by some standard, I don't know what the standard is. If you have an accredited college degree, you can immigrate to Canada. That's what I understand. Now, someone may correct me. But I believe Canada has figured this out, which is basically someone else paid for your college education will take you. Um, and and that is a pretty, like, that should basically be our national policy, in my opinion. So we'll move on. There's another question people really have burning here. So Mods, go ahead and roll us the next question. It says, I'm an SDM at Amazon, and I'm transferring orgs in March, building a new team to find roadmap under my mentor. What are the most important tenets or principles I should consider in this new role? Stefan, you're the guest. Have at it. Oh, man. Well, first off, they already referenced some things of, you know, tenets. And, and, and tenets are a, a pretty Amazon thing. You know, for those of you who may not know, if you haven't ever talked about tenets, Ethan, or just to refresh, right? These are the decision principles, right? What are the decision principles that our team is going to use? So if someone's faced with a decision on my team and I'm not there, um, they can explain their decision based on these tenets you know, when we get there. So, you know, what I would start with is um, within the Amazon ecosystem, they will support you. You're going to start a new team. Um, make sure you're clear on what your team's charter is. And, you know, how do you, and so that's one. And as you get clarity with, you know, because of data, set some initial milestone goals to track uh, with your mentor, with your boss, how is this team going to be productive? And in the spirit of fail fast, this 
most teams don't get the privilege of you know, a year before they're productive or 18 months before they're productive. Like, how are you going to actually deliver to your customers? So what's your team's charter or purpose? Part of that is what do you produce for customers and who is your customer? And, and then make sure your, your boss or your mentor is aligned on that. And then how are you going to test that in the first 90 days? Mm, how can we prove it? Incremental steps. How can we show it? Can we agree on what success looks like? Yep. Right. Are we really, that's a tenant thing in part, but are we agreed on what success looks like? Are we agreed on the timeline and how can I measure it? How will I know if I'm on track or off track? Um, I read a book long ago written by Microsoft guy. The joke in it is how does a software project become a year late? And the answer is one day at a time. You never slip a year in reality. You lose a day here, a day there. Um, you know, that, that was, uh, Steve McConnell and rapid development. Um, I was debating whether it was Steve McConnell or Joel on software. I was like, yeah, either one of them though. Right. By the way, if you're in the software world, Steve McConnell, I don't know if he's as active writing anymore, but Joel on software is like fun, snarky, uh, edgy. I find it like crack. You yeah, know? <laughs> it's it's one of he's one of those guys. I I also, Stefan, do you read Seth Godin at all? Oh, his yeah. blog. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was recommending Seth Godin's blog. Uh, there are some people. Look, I am so glad you all come here to listen to me and Stefan. Seth Godin is smarter than both of us. <laughs> Hands down. <laughs> He's, you know, you should read. He puts out like a couple paragraphs every day and at least half of days. I'm like, shit, this guy is so he's just really good at what he does. Oh, um, but you don't get an hour of him interactive. So, you know, it's it's all that. All right. We got a couple of other questions here. Um, there's a question just for me. We'll pop it up real quick. Oh, well, I don't have anything to add to what Stefan said here. Right. Focus on quick results. Amazon cares about bias for action. So the next question is, this one's for me. Love your podcast and stream. I learn a ton from it. Would you consider doing a show on how to grow and develop your team? Well, we've done some of that. Um, it's awesome you had a team of over 600 folks. Yeah, I think my biggest team was closer to 800. Oh boy, there's so much there. Um, I think my number one thing is uh, hire your tier of leaders very carefully. In other words, you can't do everything. So if you're going to manage a really big org, we've talked all about how leaders are so important. Um, hire your leaders very carefully. Um, it's and, like and, an NFL coaching staff, you know, uh, at running detail page, I had made the commitment to get closer to customers and understand shopping behavior in every country. You know, we've said I had a bunch of kids. I was not going to get on a plane and go to every country, but I made a commitment to go to every country. And my leaders represented me, right? We divided up the countries we went out, but we wanted to make sure it was it looked like one clear team. You know, we were the same people. We brought it all back. Nobody, I didn't want anybody to feel shortchanged if I was in their country. Well, I was actually, if they felt shortchanged because I was there versus one of my people, that was fantastic. Okay. Right. Fantastic. Right? Oh man, we wanted, you know, we wanted Russ. Okay, great. But um, I didn't want it the other way. And, and so I can't, I'm right there with you. Pick those, pick those senior leaders, that core team um, thoughtfully. Okay. Very good. Uh, and so I'd of course consider doing a show on this um, in our discord. There's a show suggestions channel. You can drop it in there. Uh, happy to have you do that. So we'll run a few more questions. Stefan spent a lot of time with us. We'll wind this up in not too long. Um, how did you balance? Next question is how did you both balance building something well versus building something quickly? So I have my opinion there, but it's fun building well versus building quickly. Um, you know, I, a lot of my lessons come from outside of software and Amazon. I, I, I'm a woodworker. Uh, I have animals, you know, chickens and bees. Um, and so understand what are the decisions that you're going to live with for a long time. So wait a minute. Sorry, I can't help this. You have seven kids and you raise birds and bees. Just, uh, yeah. Just yeah. fact checking. Yeah. 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 Well, it actually fits together because if you've got kids and they want a pet, 
you know, chickens, they can't overlove them. They can't, uh, if they forget to feed them, it's okay. The chickens will scratch out a living. It's good. And, and it's not a long commitment. You know, if, if the chickens got to go into the soup, you're good. So it was really practical from, from having kids. But uh, you learn about pecking order. It's a real thing. Uh, and and uh, you learn about a few other things. Uh, you don't love the bees too much either. Well, what you do learn in bees is because bees have a life cycle, 47 days. If you're uh, give or take, if you're if your hive is has bad behavior, kill the queen uh, and put a new queen in. And 47 days later, you're going to have different behavior. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So sometimes you do need to change the leader uh, on your team if you want some different behavior down the down the road. Um, but, you know, kind of in that. Yeah, I forgot what the question yeah, well was. versus quickly. Right. Because oh, there's well always pressure quickly. for speed. There's always pressure for quality. Yeah. You know, understand the decisions that, oh, I also, you know, we've done eight renovations as a house. And so changing your pipes is a, a lot different than changing your faucets. I can change faucets down the road pretty quickly. Um, you know, going with floors, you can change floors, right? But, you know, under, so understanding what you're, what you're going to have to live with for a long time uh, in, in the well part. And then also understand that everything is a step to somewhere. So, you know, do you know where the step to somewhere is? So you don't get the privilege of waiting for two years to build the perfect infrastructure. Uh, so you need to have a portfolio. What's going to deliver quickly? And what do you need to build that scales? Yeah. I, I, I don't know how to articulate it differently, but that's how I think about it. Yeah, better versus well. One of my bosses, this guy, Bill Carr, um, who wrote the book we were talking about, Working Backwards, he said, look, so much software has been shipped and not made any difference and so much else doesn't get shipped at all um essentially i took an approach often of get it out see if it works then pay the cost of fixing it because so much of it didn't work you could just kill it instead and or it just wouldn't see the light of day and so this doesn't work everywhere. And by the way, someone uh, someone else was talking about, look, speed in software is different than speed in other jobs. We have we have uh, a gentleman on our channel, Ed. Uh, he's a fun guy. He works in construction. He comes here and he drinks apparently heavily while he watches sometimes. Uh, and uh, But his point is, in construction, if you speed too much, people die, right? If you cut too many corners, you're too much of a hurry, uh, things go very badly wrong. Software, if it's not cardiac support software baked into some hospital equipment, doesn't work that way. And uh, you can experiment and roll back. Uh, Stefan and I both come from a world. He's talked about this stuff called Web Labs. Web Lab is uh, internal Amazon language for an A-B testing framework where you can actually have two solutions working at the same time. And you show solution A to some customers and B to others. And you can turn things on and off very quickly. Well, in that case, having lots of tests out there trumps building super carefully because if the test blows up, you never want it to blow up. But if it starts to blow up, you just turn it off and go back to the thing that was working until you fix it. And so low to almost zero cost experimentation speed trumps careful planning because if it starts to work, you can then squint at it and say, is it built well? Now, I've told this story before, though, about building insufficiently well. Uh, and I won't go through the whole story before. I have gotten burnt. I lean towards speed over quality. I've gotten burnt by building too low a quality and having that bite me. So there is a balance. But in general, in general, particularly at Amazon, but in general, in the software world, faster works better because once you know it works you have a signal and you can patch and rebuild now stefan was also right you have to choose between what is decoration button color can be changed very easily fundamental database architecture or information architecture is hard to change and so you have to understand which things are you know to go to ed's world which things am i pouring in concrete and which things am i building out of wood because poured concrete is really expensive to change and cutting an inch off a two by four is not as hard or even replacing a two by four. So, um, all right, we'll take a couple more questions. Someone wanted to know, did anyone actually automate their job? 
Um, cause I made this challenge, automate your way out of your job. Uh, the best example I know of this is because I worked most of my time at Amazon as a leader was, uh, both I and someone else at Amazon that I know got to the point where they had grown one of their leaders under them into bigger and bigger jobs. And the only job they had left to give them was their own. And so uh, I offered one of my leaders my job and said, the right thing to do with this leader is give him my job and I'll go find something else to do. And I know of somebody else who did that. Stefan, did you know a guy, Kurt Ort? Oh, yes. I worked so, for Kurt for a while. So Kurt says he did this. I don't remember who the other leader was, but he got to a point where he had grown somebody. I think the guy's name was Jim. I don't know anymore. Yeah. But he had grown this guy and grown this guy. And finally, he's like, I don't have anything else for him to do. The right thing to do is give him my job. He's fully qualified and I will go do something else. So I would consider that automating your way out of a job in a way. Did I ever have software engineers who did it? Um, I have, the short answer is I can't name one who completely automated their job, but certainly there were people who automated parts of their job. Um, and I'll smile about this. Okay. I'll tell you a story of software engineers cheating. So earlier in this, um, somebody who's still in chat was complaining and saying, uh, was observing. I don't know if he was complaining. He was saying, look, prime video is not as good as Netflix. Well, my team early on, very early on over a decade ago, we had products that would go in and out of windows. So we had copies of movies that were no longer part of the service, but we still had them on our server. Well, my team hacked a back door so they could watch the stuff that wasn't public anymore, which I'm sure, by the way, uh, studios hearing that would be like, what, you bastards? That's completely wrong. But my team wanted to watch the movies internally, and they knew we had copies of them. Well, honestly, like my team was willing to put in the effort, and they wanted to watch movies while they worked. Peace. Like it was not worth me getting uptight and being like, you guys shouldn't be watching that. They were busting their ass. I had a guy who was my best engineer. I'll admit this was super hard for me. He produced the most code while having three windows open, a window coding, a window chatting with his friends and a window streaming a movie. Now I am, I am a one thing at a time person. And watching him do this, all I wanted to do was yell at him and say, close the chat window in the movie. But he was my most productive engineer, so I let him do it his way, right? So, uh, you know, and it worked for him, and he did the most uh, work by far. So, I don't know, Stefan, anything you want to add to that about have you ever seen anyone automate their job, you know, free themselves up? Yeah, well, to tie way back to the beginning, if you know what your job is and what your, your contribution deliverable is, you're going to think about, is there a cheaper way to get it done? Uh, and, you know, I can't prove that anybody did this, but uh, I do think I had a couple people on my team that outsourced part of their own job because uh, between Fiverr or whatever, they, you know, could get this little thing done. And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> You know, I can't prove it, but, uh, you know, so I, I think if you're thinking about what is the job to do and, and I've had similar to Ethan, like I've said, my insurers, like, look, you know, if you can get the job done in 20 hours instead of 40 way to go. Right. Uh, I had worked consulting. And so I always thought about bill rate, right? If I'm working more than a 45, 50 hour week, I've just diluted my own salary. Right. Um, and so I either didn't scope the job, right. When I set up the goal, Right. Or, you know, my boss let me get out of, you know, if somebody did the job in 20 hours, way to go. They found something faster and they innovated. Uh, well, let's talk about, uh, I'll share dangerous leadership decisions. Cause it seems like you made one. Did I understand you correctly that someone working at Amazon outsourced part of their work to Fiverr? I don't think it was Fiverr, no, but you know, whatever. To someone yeah. not an Amazon employee. Yes. Yeah. So Bad Amazon job. officially would not like that. No. No. Okay. I'm going to share that. I did the same. I had a, uh, an L7, a senior manager on my team at Amazon. You can't have an assistant until you're a, a director in LA. And he was being driven crazy by meetings and whatever. He went and hired a woman to be his assistant and gave her his network yeah, token. Right. And she was logging in as him and managing his meetings. 
behind the scenes and his travel. Now, this is a complete breach of Amazon security, no question. Um, and this was many years ago. And I told him, I said, like, look, I wish you hadn't told me this. I'm going to deny it if I ever hear, you know, if it ever comes up, I never knew shit. <laughs> But if it's making you more efficient, you live your life. Like, understand you'll be fired for this if it comes yeah. up. But. Life no. hack. Yeah, right? you, you live your life. And. So interestingly, this is where the leadership rubber hits the road for people, right? Like, I could have come down on. Like, he was trying to do the right thing. Your guy who was outsourcing work was trying to do the right thing. Get things done. And it worked out like this guy had good judgment. He didn't, you know, he wasn't letting this woman who was backing up his calendar. But why, why would the company care? Like, why would the company um, have a shit fit? Because she's reading his email and she's not bound by any of his non-disclosures. Right. And she's not bound by Amazon insider trading and all kinds of stuff. So if she acts badly, um, <clears throat> Yeah, and I've got a message here in chat that my moderator slash wife is going to get the pizza, which I think is fantastic. You go for it. We got this. Um, so we'll wrap up soon because I have to eat. You're gonna uh, have pizza. I got pizza coming too. So yeah, I'm saying the same thing. But um, look, it's, uh, you got to make those calls as a leader to decide when to bend the rules. Um, but I would push my team on on, I mean, in some ways, like, you know, I pushed my team, Ethan, I'm sure you did yours too, of like, hey, you know, you should either try to eliminate, automate, or make cheaper. And and let's task, you know, as you see these tasks. Or outsource. So, well, yeah, make cheaper, right? So I can make it cheaper by outsourcing it, uh, which is eliminate, make cheaper. Yeah. Because uh, I'm assuming I'm going to outsource it cheaper than what I pay myself. Um, or get or better results faster. Or, yeah. Yeah. Same. Yeah. Or I'm going to pick up a more valuable task because it's outsourced, right? Yeah. So can I spend my stuff, spend my time on things that I have goals on and that I'm uniquely positioned and equipped to do, right? So sometimes there may be people better equipped, but they're not positioned to make the the decision or piece of work that I am. This is a rugby thing I, I take in. Like, hey, sometimes you you're close. You look like a rugby player. I never, did you play <laughs> rugby yourself? Uh, I've only played for fun. My wife, however, played in college and is in her college hall of fame as a leading scorer. So wow. uh, our kids play. And uh, yeah, so we, we still are pretty this is, this is a This is a tough game. I'm a hockey player, so nothing but respect. <laughs> yeah. That, where I went to college, they wore shirts that said, give blood, play rugby. Play rugby. Absolutely. Oh. Uh, and, and rugby's a fun, there's lots of fun lessons, like so this whole notion of scrum and sprint, but um you know, so you, yeah, you know, rugby is fun too. Cause there's always two parties, you know, there's two games, you shove each other's face in the ground, which I always described as Amazon's kind of, we're disagreeing about the customer, but now we've committed. And then there's the after party and the same guy that you've just been shoving the face in the ground, you're not arm and arm drinking a beer. I'm like, we should be able to do that. But, um, you know, so that's kind of uniquely positioned, right? There's bigger people than me, but they're further away from the ball or there's faster people, but they're further away. Um, and I would push my team to do the same, right? Are you really uniquely positioned and uh, uniquely equipped? Or can you find someone else who's better equipped and better positioned to do the thing? Like the guy's calendar management. Yeah. Which, it's too bad, by the way. Look, it's too bad that sometimes corporate policies get in the way of practical solutions. There are reasons for those policies. And look, I knew that if it did get traced back to me that I winked and nodded at this, I was taking a risk of getting fired. And I decided that for this manager who was valuable and for his solution, I trusted him and I was willing to gamble. Uh, but um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, you look as a leader, you have to make those decisions about when to take a gamble to get things done. Uh, and in the end, results cover a host of sins. Now, sometimes they will get you uh, done. So... Anyway, but you also showed trust in your team. And so, you know, in the theme of this particular discussion, uh, trust is a currency in, in totally in, right. And trust is a currency with leaders and in your leadership team. Yeah. And so that was probably repaid. Yeah, uh, yeah in absolutely. Spain. Absolutely. In You've Spain. got to know who you can trust. And then when you show yeah. them trust, they'll show it back to you. Oh, in space. Uh, it's like you can't outgive your wife. I don't believe you can outgive your wife. 
you know, <laughs> my wife just like, no matter what I give to her, it's always more. I'm like, man, I cannot give my wife. Yeah. yeah. It just comes, you trust your team. And if you've hired well, then you've, you've built your team and you've built a learning environment. Um, I've always, it's always found that I, I, my team is, has repaid trust. All right. Faith. A couple more quick questions. The question yeah. here is, um, Ethan, how did you possibly work 60 hours a week of pure work? How would you recommend we increment our own workload to achieve the same weekly productivity? So I did work 60 hours. Um, at part of that time I was divorced. Part of that time I had a very supportive wife. Um, the second part. So I was divorced first and then got married to somebody who was also an executive and understood this life. Um, and I love my work. And so I worked a lot and then I went home. So when I was online, I was on and when I was off, I was off. I don't think you can work that long and not like what you do. I mean, I'm sure you can, by the way, I'm sure there'll be somebody in chat who says, Oh no, I work that hard and I hate my job, but what a miserable life. Um, I at least liked what I was doing. Ah, uh, part of it is wiring. I am wired to work. I was, I was, um, I was answering someone's career question last night, uh, who was asking me, should I do a job A or job B? Two really good choices. She either wanted to know, should she go join McKinsey as a consultant or Amazon as a product manager? And um, I said, look, what do you actually want to do? Like it's 1047 p.m. and I'm answering you, even though I'm retired and don't need to work at all. I'm doing it because I like to help people. Which job is going to get you that response that when you find yourself working at 1047 p.m. working in quotes, you won't feel bad about it. Uh, do that job. Do that one. And so, yeah, do that one. Pick that one. Now, these are first world problems, right? There's a woman at Kellogg at, at a graduate school a good school who has offers from McKinsey and Amazon. So she has first world problems or even zero world problems, right? No problems at all. She may think she has problems, but she doesn't. Um, that's how I worked. I don't know. You probably work very hard too, Stefan. What would you say? Well, I would, I would add to that. First off, again, I already described this. People would be like, what's the work culture at Amazon? What's your work-life balance? You know, and I think the first part, well, I had a lot of kids, so I had a lot of life. So I need a lot of work to balance my life. But um, the uh, uh, so, but to MBA students, sometimes I say, go get a life, right? Because that's how you're going to do it. You know, you actually have to have something to balance. Don't wait for your life to show up. But I would also describe hobby time and vocation time, right? Like, hey, you know, if you like what you do and you're having fun and it's a great opportunity, like Amazon to me was like free college. It was like free postdoc. I could email someone like Ethan and be like, tell me about streaming. Can I buy you a coffee to get 30 minutes just for you to educate me? And nine times out of 10, he'd say, yeah, it might be two weeks, but you know, I'll get back to you. I could email the chief economist or whatever. So if you're fortunate enough to be in a, a company where you like what you do, you have to remember to put down your tools and, and have something you want to go to. The second thing I would add to, which is just reinforce what Ethan's saying. Second thing I would add though, is I would, um, I looked at annual rhythms really carefully. And so my wife was on board with, she knew what OP1 was, you know, this annual planning cycle, the six weeks before we present our yeah. annual plan. She's like, I'm taking the kids and we're going on a trip to see my mom. Um, you know, good luck. Hope it goes well. Cause I know you're going to be working 60 to 80 hours for the next, you know, six weeks. And like a farmer pulling in his harvest, you know, and then it's done. And I scheduled a vacation for the yeah. weekend yeah. after OP1. Because also people get into unhealthy habits. It takes six weeks to build a habit. And if you get into this, like, I'm going to work overtime and push real hard, you know, careful of your habits. That just became a habit. Do you want it to be? And the answer may be yes, but you should make that an intentional, thoughtful choice. Um, and so I've made sure I break that habit. Um, so over the course of a year, I work 50 hour weeks. Some weeks I work 60, some weeks I work 40. So keep that seasonality and that rhythm in mind because um, there's times you want to work hard or you have to. Mm -hmm. Sorry, answering yeah, a question in chat. Someone yeah. asked me, is my purpose public? Is it something I share? And yeah, it's a banner on my website, right? I, I'm, <laughs> I have the luxury look. Uh, people ask me, am Isn't I entitled all kinds of things? Isn't that? it fun? Isn't it fun and rewarding? Yeah. Like helping people like, yeah. you know, and I, I, 
I admit I have zero, you know, there's, there's people talk about first world problems. I need to, I've decided mine are zeroth world, right? Like I, I get to come on here and chat with interesting people and we have a ball and we help people in the bargain. Like who, you know, what's not to like? Yeah. What's not to like? Uh, so super, super privileged in that sense. But um, look, uh, if you have that chance, great. And you earn your way to it, right? I earned my way to it by earning my stripes at a lot of other places. So um, the last question I'm going to take tonight super quickly is um, what does a typical product manager, product manager paper at Amazon look like? And I'm going to cheat my way through this and say, we've answered this before. Go read Working Backwards by Bill Carr and Colin Breyer because they will show you an example and tell you exactly that. So there's a great book written about it. I don't need to answer it. Stefan's going to hold it up. There it is. That book just came out. It's not by us. Go get it and read it and you'll have your answer. Um, I'm going to look at these others real quick. Uh, so I would, I would add Ethan again, yeah. it explains in the book, it's less about writing and more about decision making. It's more about good thinking. Right. Yeah. It's less about writing. It is more about good thinking. Um, one of the things the book will say and th that I believe is good writing comes from clear thinking. And so you get your thinking clear and then you just put that down in words. So, um, <clears throat> so uh, the other question here um, somebody has asked is about career transitions. And that's my next show. We're actually going to do a career planning show with another guest on Thursday. Um, and so to answer that question, which I'll put up here, but not answer is we're going to come back on Thursday. We're going to have a guest on who wants to make a career transition. And, uh, yeah. Did so, and somebody that? wants to ask me about Pittsburgh, uh, where I went to school. <laughs> you the teaser of who that guest is, Ethan? Uh, the guest is Matt McCluskey. So okay. Matt McCluskey was a director, worked for me at Twitch. He ran Twitch Commerce. Uh, he formerly was CFO of the Halo franchise at, um, what is it, 343 Studios at Microsoft. Um, he's now outside doing his own thing. I think he's doing something really interesting. He's working, trying to modernize Toys R Us in Canada. So Toys R Us uh, went out in the U.S., but it's still existent in Canada. And um, so he switched to the games and toys business. Um, so anyway, he has a model of how to architect a career transition because he was educated as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So he came out as a lawyer, became a CFO, then became a business leader. Uh, so he's been through some transitions and, um, just like Stefan reached out to me and said, should we have a talk about this? Can we share it on your channel? And we had a great time. Matt wants to come on and share his model, um, for how to do that. So. So anything else you want to add, Stefan? Anything you want to say in wrapping up? I'll give the mic back to you. And thank you for your generous donation of time. And it's been a blast bouncing ideas off you. Thank you. I was going to say the same. First off, I, I think you, um, it's been helpful to articulate some thoughts around Teams and looking at Teams and Amazon and then translating that to other environments. So thanks for sharing your time to bounce that off and, and be able we can do it in front of this audience uh, is, is super fun and enjoyable as well. Uh, so looking forward to an, another opportunity if one comes up that I can share to your show and share to your audience. I'm sure you'll be back. Uh, and I have to come see you sometime. You live, uh, you, even though your company is called Vantage, you live in Moscow, Idaho. Is that right? Yeah, I do. So we're in the Palouse here. It's great fly fishing and rafting in the summer and uh, a lot of good uh, outdoor mountain biking and stuff through the through all four seasons. So. Yeah, I, I I need to spend more time in Idaho. I mean, I have a lot of things I want to do, but I need to spend more time in Idaho. It's such a beautiful place. The Sawtooth and wow. is it McLean? Mc, is that McCall? McCall. It's just yeah, gorgeous. between here and Boise, it's just beautiful. Um, I I was last in Idaho for any amount of time during the eclipse. That's where we came. We wow. we we put this the is effort in to get country. So yeah. We, we put in the effort to get right under the eclipse, which, by the way, I'll say for anybody who's never done it, if you ever have the chance, being under a total eclipse and seeing darkness in the daytime, and it, it's like the most interesting three minutes you can, you can achieve. So, uh, 
All right. Uh, so with that, um, I will let Stefan go. I'll take on, unless you want to hear my answer, somebody is banging away about what do I think of Pittsburgh? Are you curious or not? Because I can let you go. You know, I've been to Pittsburgh. I got to go recruit to Pittsburgh in the middle of winter. Pittsburgh, I kind of claim in the Midwest. Because if you come it from is. Pittsburgh, you know, people work. There's a history of work and grit in Pittsburgh, and you've dealt with snow. So I've been there. I'm going to let you go on that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's a good signal to me. And um, uh, thanks again for your help. It's fun. I love building companies and, and giving them new vantage points. So, and so. by the way, if you need somebody, let me let me do a plug for what Stefan does. If you know somebody or you need uh, to learn, his ability is to work with another leader on how to implement the implement and optimize the checkout process. Basically, how can you take your business and get people to buy from it the way they buy from Amazon? He's got the knowledge to work through the process of you've got some product and nobody's buying it, nobody's finding your website and there's friction in your checkout process. He understands that soup to nuts and he's working with a company he's told me about just by applying what he learned at Amazon and letting them do the same things, their sales have gone through the roof. Now, that's like, uh, I mean, look, super secret, right? He's He's been inside what he called the money button of the internet. And he knows how to go apply that money button in the internet's technology to your company and your website. So uh, he's at vantageleader.com and uh, that's your opportunity. So thanks guys. It's fun to help people shop. All right. So I love it. Thanks, Ethan. See you guys. Cheers. So I'm going to let him go. And uh, let's see, I got to manage my different controls here. Do, 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 do. I'll bring it back to me. All right, so Pittsburgh, we're going we're gonna to wind up talking about Pittsburgh. Why not? Let's have some fun. Uh, I spent 14 years in the Berg on and off. Um, and what the hell do I think of Pittsburgh? So Pittsburgh was known when I went there. Its nickname was Hell with the Lid Off. That's, uh, and that was the old reputation of Pittsburgh back in the day, hell with the lid off. Um, and it was called that, um, whoa, what the hell did I do there? I just screwed up my display. Trying to grab the window, grab the overlay instead. All right, it was known as hell with the lid off. So I've said that like four times now while I've been adjusting my screen, sorry. Deal with it, suck it up. It had a terrible reputation, uh, but, it was the first big city I ever lived in. I was a farm boy. So I found it fascinating. Like it was great. I was away from home. I made friends. So I love Pittsburgh. I now recognize it for what it is. It is a Midwest city. It has problems. It was great. I, uh, but it look, let me organize this. Um, I preferred Pittsburgh to where I was from because it had the amenities of a city and it had outdoors with the mountains. So I learned to ski there. I went spelunking in a cave for the first time. There was outdoor adventure and woods. Um, then I had the chance to move to DC, Boston, and finally Seattle. And look, uh, Pittsburgh can't compete on assets, um, but there's nothing wrong with Pittsburgh and there's a lot of fun stuff. The people there are passionate about their city. They have, uh, they have a great local regional accent that gets made a lot of fun of, but they're also proud of, um, in other places you say y'all or Ewins, but in Pittsburgh it's yins, Y I N Z. And so the people in Pittsburgh are known as yinzers, uh, as one of their nicknames. And they have they drop the word uh, to be or the the they so that it's a it's a complete sentence in Pittsburgh to say the car needs washed. Uh, you can leave the to be out. Um, so yeah, it's a city with a strong local culture and very cool. It's tough people. Uh, you know the the fellow in chat here is new and is talking about Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh and a lot of the Midwest has the problem, not just Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, where I'm originally from, I'm from near Cincinnati, a lot of Ohio, uh, a lot of the Midwest, it has the problem that the, the, the more educated people, the people with more opportunity have moved away to the coast. We were talking earlier 
about um, people moving away to the coast and people who had moved to the West Coast. Uh, yeah, it is true. There's ignorance everywhere if you look for it. Edgy is right about that. But second, people move to the coast to get more opportunity. What does that mean, though? It leaves behind the people in the Midwest who haven't, for whatever reason, they haven't made that move, and it's thinned out the ambition there. Uh, and look, a lot of the small towns near where I'm from in Ohio, I call as method, uh, I call them meth-infected hellholes. Uh, because there's no hope left for the people. There are no good jobs, or not no, but there's very little good opportunity, and they fall into drugs and meth and problems, and it's sad. So I'm not here to rain on them. I hope, they, I hope the Midwest changes and is reinvigorated. But look, economic opportunity has always moved. People came to the new world from the old world to get opportunity. First, uh, you know, first Columbus looking for opportunity to get to the Indies. And then uh, the Spanish looking for opportunity in quotes to exploit natural resources and people. And I'm not saying they were good. That's not my point. But they came here for opportunity. You can bet their ass about that. Their opportunity was to take gold from the people who had it. And that was an opportunity. So they did it. It's not I mean it's good, but they moved for opportunity. Um, and then settlers moved for religious freedom and on and on. You don't need a history lesson from me. Um, but the point is, people have always moved for opportunity. And right now, people are moving out of the Midwest, including Pittsburgh, for opportunity elsewhere. And that, uh, you know, uh, I love Pittsburgh. I love to visit. I have good friends there. But that is generally a true statement that they have out migration. Now, COVID may reverse some of that. People are now out migrating away from the high rents on the coast. So COVID may change some stuff. So, so anyway... Uh, people go where opportunity is, right? Um, and they don't worry about what they're leaving behind. Um, so uh, I will, I'm happy I moved, but I, I, somebody asked me what I like about Pittsburgh. Look, I chose my um, sports teams there. That's where I formed my sports allegiances. So I love the hockey team. I love the football team. Um, you know, so uh, I don't know. I'll always have a soft spot in my heart for Pittsburgh, but um, I'm okay having left. So, uh, and it's no longer hell with the lid off, at least. It's no longer uh, gross and, and whatever. And the pizza is here. So that's my cue. Hey, if I was ever had a reason to leave, it had been fantastic to see you all. Um, I hope you will come back Thursday where we'll, where we'll have Matt McCluskey and a, a guest um, go through a career uh, planning, a career path planning and transition plan. So with that, I've had so many great guests here today in chat, so many great contributors. Pentaquan, if you're still listening, thank you for the gifts. Duke of Thought, uh, good to see you here. A lot of new people um, joining in, a lot of sub gifts and subs. Thank you all, and I hope to see you. Join our Discord, follow me on LinkedIn, and I look forward to talking to you all in a few days. Eh. I switched my displays, making it hard to go offline.